Nope. Up in here. Can you guys hear me? Annette? Okay. All right, good deal. All right, a little bit of rotary uh, education. This one we just actually said, so um, one of the, the four-way tests. One of the most widely printed and quoted statements of, the, of business ethics in the world is the rotary four-way test. Do you know that? Now you do. It was created by Rotarian uh, Herbert J. Taylor in 1932 when he was asked to take charge of the Chicago-based club alumni company, uh, which was facing bankruptcy at the time, actually. Taylor then looked for a way to serve, uh, to save, I'm sorry, the struggling company mirrored in the depression caused financial difficulties. He drew up a 24-word code of ethics for all employees to follow in their business and professional lives. The four-way test became the guide of sales, production, advertising, and all relations with dealers and customers. And the survival of the company was created to this simple philosophy. Isn't that interesting? Herb uh, Taylor became president of Rotary International during the 1954-55 year. And the four-way test was adopted, actually, by Rotary in 1943 and was translated into more than 100 languages and published in thousands of ways. The message should be known and followed by all Rotarians. I'm very proud to say this uh, each day, each time we have our meetings, and each time we have a board meeting or uh, a discussion, we always go back to the four-way test. And that is, of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? If it's not, then it's not worth going in. Is it fair to all concerned, everyone involved? Will it build goodwill and better friendships among everyone? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? Um, so pretty interesting there. Reminder that next week is our district governor meeting extremely important and extremely important that we represent and we attend either attend in person or attending on zoom we will have the district governor broadcast live on the screen uh, and she will pre be presenting and speaking to us via zoom so we have a board meeting for those board meeting and leadership committee chairs from 10 to 11 on next wednesday the 19th we will zoom in from your location. So wherever you are, um, I send out the invite to just zoom in. We'll have that meeting with the district governor. I'll host it, as we're doing here, from 10 to 11. After that, we will come here. Um, we will set up, and we will have our rotary, regular <laughs> rotary meeting uh, where she will be presenting um, at that time. We will also um, be honored to present yeah. her with a, a check portfolio uh, for the foundation, um, and we will discuss that at that time. I just want to remind everybody in preparations and everything that we have been doing, I can't thank Lloyd, I can't thank you enough, uh, and our team members for helping and making sure that we're ready and prepared for the meeting. I did drop off the binder to her yesterday, so all about our club and all, everything that we have done is at her fingertips. I wanted her to preview that before we had the meeting. Any questions regarding the district governor meeting next week? Okay. There is no fundraising activity at this time. She is planning on visiting the clubs <coughs> beginning in January, between January and March. Uh, if and when that does happen, uh, we will be doing the satchel um, project. Club directories. With a, thank you to Lloyd. Um, our club directories have now been updated and are ready and are here in the front of the room. Um, will you can please come get you one before you leave, um, or we can pass them out. Um, but they are updated with all of our members and committees, etc. So very, very uh, beneficial book there. And I will be bringing one to the district governor 
uh, at the district office next later on this week. For me, in after hours, our satellite club uh, is hosting their first meeting today at six o'clock at Brassers in Maurice. Um, so if any of you want to attend, you will be very glad to go there as well. And one last thing, um, just something that is uh, upcoming, and we had a meeting yesterday, uh, Rob and Rob Greer and myself with Francis Plaison uh, with the Cattle Festival Association. Um, they are, of course, the Cattle Festival was canceled this year. Um, so they support and do scholarships for the community. They support the livestock show and pay for a lot of that for 4-H. And their funds are pretty much depleted. Um, so they were looking to do a fundraiser, and we certainly willing to help and cook and provide services and so forth if we need. So we're looking into that um, and more to come on what they are going to be planning to do. So we can help them out uh, for them to raise some funds uh, to continue and maintain their monthly bills that they have at the Red Barn facility, etc. All right, and now we'll go ahead and turn over to John. And then we'll get called to come up and introduce you to this up speed. Good afternoon. How's everyone today? We, we have no um, no birthdays today. And when I when I make this announcement, if I miss anybody, if you have a birthday in the room, let, let me know because we we go off of what's all the. Um, well, I'm 28 today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. What's the date? What's your, when's your birthday? Oh, well, today. years with Royal Engineers, 
did a couple of years for himself working with that and that. He actually graduated from Magnese, which is, is kind of something that I, I very seldom run across anybody who graduated from Magnese that didn't play football or something like that. So that's one of the good things. Um, he's got a lot of memberships he's in. He's, he serves as a president of the Shinjir Hicks Plain Coastal Restoration and Protection Authority. He's a board member, serves as treasurer, secretary treasurer for the Test for Me and Freshwater District, which we all know about also, because we're part of all that stuff. And he's past president of, of Gulf Coast Joint Venture, which was something that we worked with. And most importantly now, what he's really, really involved in, what I like to listen to what he talks about when he goes, is the Louisiana Watershed Initiative Region Fire <coughs> Steering Committee member. And that's very important for us right now in Vermeer Parish because we got we got monies to do some projects and he's gonna probably talk about those. Um, again, he's uh, he he does a lot of monitoring of what's going on in the coast. He uh, he he looks at the intercoastal waterway and all everything that goes through there. He looks at all our marshes. In fact, uh, when you were with him, you were with him, Saturday, you know? uh, He's also been a, a, a successful project manager in a large-scale federal and state government environmental project. For you guys that don't know, to get a project off the ground, you've got to jump through a thousand hoops, and it takes a lot of time to get permitting and get everything done and get all your, your, your keys crossed and your eyes dotted. It, it's not something you just write a letter and you get. It's a lot goes into it. And he knows, he knows all the acronyms for everything because sometimes you'll start talking, in a meeting, he'll start talking about all these things, and I'll have to raise my hand and say, well, what does that one mean again? You know, so they got, he's got a Bible on that. He's also, uh, I already said that about the joint venture, but he's represented the Louisiana National uh, Department of National Resources, and he also is very concerned with conserving a migratory bird and the habitat along the western U.S. Gulf Coast. Please give a warm welcome and Mr. Ralph Livesack. Thank you. Paul and I go way back, but what he doesn't tell you is that he doesn't give me all the first line hints where he's catching fish at. He tells me you should have been here yesterday. So, uh, yeah, Paul and I go way back along with several members out here in uh, uh, your club. And I appreciate you uh, letting me come here this afternoon to give you a little talk about uh, our coast and what's going on with it. Uh, also, as Paul alluded to, I want to give you an update on the watershed initiative that's going on right now and uh, some potential funding and projects that are going to be in our area and a different way of thinking about uh, our watershed and how we have to think of it as a whole and zoom out of just our just the million powers thinking. We need to start thinking watershed uh, uh, restoration. So. Uh, what I want to talk about is, is naturally, Louisiana is a national treasure. It's nothing, nothing new to anybody in this room. You know, we have over two million people that live in the coast. We uh, we have uh, five million uh, migratory waterfowl that make its way down here, and we have uh, uh, waterborne commerce with our ports in this in this state. Uh, but Louisiana Coast is facing a crisis. What I want to do is just kind of take you down a little bit of uh, rubbing my crystal ball and kind of showing what will possibly happen in the next 50 years if we do nothing. Uh, as you can see, during the past 50 years, we've had some erosion. You can see by all the hot spots of land loss in the area. The two areas of gain are our two deltas, which is in the Chafalaya and the Bird's Foot down in Plaquemine where you have active sediments coming down there. But this is what it would look like if you would run a ball for that 10 year um, without any actions. If we stop doing any restoration that we're doing right now, you can see a little bit of red in there. Go ahead. At 20 years, it, it, it gets a little bit progressive. At 30 years, you can see it's a little more. At 40 years, it starts getting pretty noticeable. And at 50 years, it gets pretty detrimental. What I want to leave you with, I don't want to let you, let you have this as a doomsday scenario, let's all pack up our books and let's go to, to Arkansas, 
is has everybody seen Rob Perillo's 10 day forecast? Okay. At the end of 10 days, does he have the rain or the sunshine he's talking about? <coughs> Not all. But he has the trend that's going there. And that's what this crystal ball does. It, it, it gets projections into 50 years, and we have a trend that we're going in the bad side if we don't do anything. Now, what makes the 50 years so difficult in, in predicting what's going on? Right here. We have tropical storms, hurricanes that come in here and just play havoc with our economy and our coast. We had two devastating storms, Katrina and Rita, which demolished our state economically and, and uh, coastal-wise, and we're still trying to make some recoveries from those two storms. Katrina hit the eastern part of the state, and Rita hit the western part of the state. Uh, just a detrimental blow in 2005. Well, that kind of put everybody at ease because everybody was used to Audrey 50 years ago. I'm good. I'm good for the next 50 years. We're good. Well, Lord, behold, three years later, Ike comes around and blows away Cameron and Vermillion Parish again. He is another typical and very hard blow for us to regain from. And as a matter of fact, I helped Cameron recover some of their, when I was with Royal Engineering, mm -hmm. recovering some of their disaster recovery, and they're still trying to come back from where they were. Um, also, the Harvey event with 2017, where we had 50 inches of rain come in there. Uh, I can't imagine that you would have 50 inches of rain right here in Louisiana. Uh, we had a little taste of it in 2016, which I'll talk about a little bit more, but we had upwards of 25 inches in this area in a very short time frame. Uh, so what I want to talk about a little bit is just kind of lay the groundwork of we have a coastal master plan. And we update this plan every six years. We're three years into the coastal plan of 2017. And basically, it's a framework of decisions on how we do this. And it is also a list of projects that we can put out there uh, that we can give us the most good with our limited resources. Uh, two decision uh, drivers is basically the sediment. And uh, no, excuse me, the uh, decision driver thing here is reducing flood risk and building and maintaining land. That's the two things that we want to do. We want to reduce our flood risk and we want to build land with this coast restoration effort. So what we want to do is by uh, use uh, the best available science with our decision drivers, but we have constraints. The sediments is a big constraint because they may be plentiful in one area as they are in the two deltas, but it's tough to get them in the areas that they're needed. The other constraint is funding. That's a continual fight for every dollar and it's very competitive, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. We also have other matrix in there that you pl plug in, and that's all part of the science. We never like to make anything too easy, so we have to plug in all these other matrix. <laughs> um, just wanted to let you know by project types. There's a lot of project types out there um, that for uh, restoration and for um, uh, risk reduction. Uh, the biggest items you can see uh, for risk reduction is basically the levee. Um, the main parish in this area does not have a whole lot of levees. Um, there's pluses and minuses with levees. Uh, levees can protect you from storm surge, but they're very, very, very expensive. Um, in more populated areas, in New Orleans and, and, and Lafourche and Terrebonne, you have some levees over there, but they're more subject to erosion than we are over here. The other one is, is uh, marsh creation, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, getting back on the funding uh, on CPRA, which is the Coastal uh, Protection and Restoration Authority, uh, they have funding revenues, um, two main sources, our state mineral revenues and our Gulf of Mexico. Here's one of those acronyms, is GOMESA. We refer to it as GOMESA. But the state mineral, on the funding, mechanism on the state revenues. Um, these are all in gas revenues that are coming in, and I don't need to tell you the story of what's happened in the last few years on all in gas. We used to have a pretty steady, in, uh, uh, reliable source of funding. It's getting more and more questionable. So is the Go Mesa. Uh, the Go Mesa is, rev is 
basically the revenues that come from the outer continental shelf. Louisiana always just had the three year, uh, I mean, excuse me, the three mile state limit. Past three miles were all federal work, and they still are to some extent, but we weren't getting any of those revenues past the state waters. All that water past there was going into the federal colonies. So our state senators um, and representatives got together in Congress and we got a bigger share of that pie. We got up to about 30% uh, 30 of those uh, gulf producing states that can share in that revenue. And there's an elaborate formula that I don't quite understand. It's changing all the time since when Congress makes anything simple. But it's a, a pretty elaborate formula to get this worked out. Um, we're trying to get more share of it. Uh, recently, Senator Cassidy tried to get us some more uh, funding. It's just an ongoing battle, battle and it's very competitive. Uh, other streams of funding uh, uh, is with, is with uh, and here's some of the, the book of, you know, we have National Fish Wildlife Foundation, NIFWIS. We have NERDA, which is Natural Resources. My all time favorite is Restore. Can you believe this? I don't know who thought this up. The resource economic system, sustainable tourist opportunities, revived economics at Gulf Coast State. Oh my God, that's store, uh, restore fund. So that's how we call it, and, and we go from there. And then the QIPRA, which is our Coastal Wetland Planning and Protection Agency. So these, I want to highlight on the restore, QIPRA, and other sources that the million parish has been able to tap into in doing some of our projects. Very competitive, but we've had a large support of a lot of people in this room and with our coastal and our police jury in securing some of these funds. Uh, let's take a closer look at our South Central and Southwest. Let's take a look at some of our projects that we have in our area. So, I want to highlight one is the Rockefeller Shoreline. This project is so close by and so many of our residents use the Rockefeller Refuge. And in this particular case, it was eroding pretty quick. We had some areas of that shoreline right on the Gulf that was eroding at anywhere from 50 to 100 feet per year. Can you grasp that? That's about as long as this building is in one year, that shoreline was gone. So what they did is do some shoreline protection. And uh, almost immediately after building one of these segments, you have a lot of land built up. Once you protect it, and keep those sediments from washing away with each tidal event, you have a buildup of land and it's been very successful. The uh, project was about three miles long and it cost about $19 million to do it. They just finished constructing it and right now they're laying the groundwork in the upcoming years to get additional funding since it's worked so good. Uh, a little closer to home, the Freshwater Bayou Marsh Creation Project. This project has been a long time coming. Um, it's a marsh creation project that's in the planning stages. Um, it's east of uh, Pawn Island, and you can see those two highlighted areas kind of show what has happened um, in, in a 20 to 30 year span of how much open water has happened in there. So what they're trying to do is basically create about 400 um, and, and some change <coughs> acres of marsh creation in there. We also want to take advantage of the shoreline protection that is happening. We've done real good in doing some shoreline protection up and down freshwater bayou, where we've prevented that bayou from getting wider and wider and wider. We, we kept it honed in on its, uh, its authorized length. But what we want to do now is start creating some marsh behind that. So the uh, this project, it's, this picture is a little bit hard to see because it's part of the 50 you have two cells. Uh, about 200 acres of feet of where we're going to try to create some marsh. The borrow area is where we actually get that sediment is in the Gulf of Mexico, that square box down there. And we're going to hydrologically dredge that area and, and uh, suction dredge it all the way up to five or six miles through those uh, areas and pump it over the levees. Um, pretty, pretty uh, interesting project once it's under construction. But there again, uh, this project is going to come up for funding in December of this year. It's a very, very competitive process, and we'll probably need some of your support. I know I'm on the Christian Police Jury and trying to get some support from the landowners and some of these NGOs, which is a non-government organization such as yourself, to help us out with that. Um, next one is the Coles Bayou Restoration. This project was just completed.
completed not too long ago. Very good project. This project is, again, a marsh creation project with about nine water control structures. These marsh creation projects um, were about 400 acres total. We have three different cells in there. And then we had about a series of nine water control structures to help move the water from Little Galeen Bay where we had the terrace in the bay and move that special water south of there and give it an opportunity to nourish those marshes. Um, again, it was benefited about 400 acres. Um, we had about nine culverts in there. It cost about $20 million. As you can see, the trend here is nothing's cheap out there. It takes a lot of money to do this, and a lot of logistical nightmares, and it's just you can't drive your truck from any of these places. You gotta get cars, you gotta get uh, tugboats, you gotta get crew boats. Um, and it was completed in the fall of 2019. Uh, the other funding sources that we've been able to take advantage of here in Vermillion Parish is state-only surplus funds. In 2007 and 2009, when we were a little bit more flush in our, in our uh, revenues, the post restoration had put a, uh, aside some restoration funds. We were able to solicit and tap into those funds because we invited some state people to come down for our Marsh Coastal Day, which was held a few times. And we actually took them out in boats and showed them these areas. And we were able to benefit by two particular areas here on Freshwater Bay depicted by that green line and that yellow line. And basically, we're going to have some additional shoreline protection in the tune of about, uh, uh, both of them combined, I think it's going to be about four to five million dollars. So uh, it's going to be some added restoration, shoreline protection that, that isn't there now. Uh, also, we're going to be doing something on the northern shore of the Middle Bay. Uh, if anybody's familiar with the uh, Bostock Canal project, we you come out there, we built some shoreline protection years ago, and almost immediately after we did that, we had accumulation of sediment behind there. So what we want to do is mimic that same thing and build about 16,000 linear feet east and west of, of uh, freshwater, excuse me, of Boston Canal, and protect that area, and I'll hope to accumulate some of the properties on there. You use this as sort of a catalyst. This becomes a success, then I can get a more success story and run to the capital and try to get additional funds, which is very competitive. But when you have a good project, it is a little bit more easier to um, As I was telling you about the Go Mesa funds, the Gulf of Mexico offshore funds, um, they are every year stipend that comes to the state and to the parish, and there's a formula to figure all that out. Um, for me, the parish gets close to about 800,000 a year on the good year. Now, this year is probably not, I mean, the years coming are probably not going to be that good. So what the million parish wanted to do was kind of leverage those good years while we were making some pretty good money. As you saw from those other projects, $800,000 sounds like a lot of money. You couldn't even get a project for $800,000. That meant anything to, to do any substantial amount. So what we did was bond out these, uh, these dollars and we put such a sweetheart deal. It was a lot of um, negotiations and everything. I'm pleased to at the time. Myself got in, in, in coordinating and uh, discussion with these bonding agencies and worked out a sweetheart of a deal. Mr. Ryan Barriock, which is our representative, was very instrumental in helping us do this. Uh, basically, all the risk is on that bonding agency. If our Go Mesa dollars go away tomorrow, and that's not a unrealistic thing to happen with the state of the economy now, with people looking for dollars, those go made dollars could go away. I'm not saying they are, but they could. Bonding agency takes that whole risk. We're, we're scot-free. I don't know how we made the deal, but we made the deal. So we're excited about that. We got our $10 million, and we're actually going to do three very substantial projects. One of them being rocking, um, which I was just talking with Paul about, was the Southwest Pass. We have that little spit of land. Look, my throwing arm is not like what it used to be. Uh, I can easily throw a very small rock across that little spit of land. And if we lose that, we lose some good oyster beds and everything else. That would just erode and make Southwest Pass much wider and deeper. Is along the Gulf Coast, um, coming out of Freshwater Bayou to your west, along Chenier Tig, and um, there's another point down there that we also had some shoreline protection in a demonstration project. 
they worked excellent. We had some living shorelines with some oyster reefs down there, um, had excellent results from that. So we're going to expand upon that and uh, for a tune of about $4 million. So well, that takes up our $10 million that we have for the Gil Nation Dollar. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the watershed initiative. Uh, let me first tell you how it came about. In 2016, as everybody knows, <clears throat> we had some pretty devastating rainfalls, not only here in, in, in Lafayette, the millionaire, but also in March in the St. Uh, East Baton Rouge and St. Tammany and, and Livingston parishes. They had a pretty detrimental flood also. The way that came about was that uh, in the wake of these events, they realized that we needed to have some strategy in giving some uh, communities uh, long-term hazard, hazard mitigation and resiliency for our area. We have to start thinking about our water on a watershed basis, not just here in the Dominion Parish. We need to think uh, 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 basin-wide. And the carrot on that is Congress allocated $1.2 billion for the state of Louisiana. Um, that is, puts it in a very competitive motion that we need to go ahead and do this, but um, they have some dollars that we can actually get some good projects in. Um, I just wanted to kind of highlight this real quick. <clears throat> the reason you want to kind of do this is point to one thing that 5,000 uh, residents we had a total of about 5,000 structures in the 2016 flood that was inundated. About 3,000 of those structures were a foot or less. We can't really mitigate for 50 inches of rain. There's no way I can design, no way anybody can design uh, to take care of a 50 inch rain. But I can handle zero to a foot. And if I can mitigate that and have projects on the ground to kind of lessen or dampen that effect, 3,000 or something residents would be without problems. Can you imagine that ripple effect of the economic and everything else that folds into that if I can protect that? So that's what we're striving for. We're not striving to prevent 50 inches of rain and damage. It's to mitigate what we can. Okay. Uh, the way to do that is that the watershed initiative came about. They broke the watershed, the state of Louisiana, into eight zones. We happen to be in zone number five, and um, zone number five comprised of about 16 parishes. And we, uh, yeah. so uh, in this particular, uh, in our watershed, we have several rivers that we need to contend with. We have Bayou Tesh, we have the upper reaches of the Mermitaw, we have the Mermitaw River itself, we have the Vermilion River, and we have the uh, influences of the Chapelai Basin. All of these things play into uh, the Vermilion uh, watershed. Uh, not just the Vermilion mm -hmm. Parish. Go ahead. The next thing. What we want to try to do on here is develop a comprehensive stormwater watershed management plan. Okay, we want to take a, a play out of the Coastal Restoration Master Plans uh, uh, Master Plan book. It has been very successful in getting additional funding to get um, uh, awareness of what's going on. So that's what we want to do with this. We want to set up and develop a watershed model. We need some tools to help us understand how water flows. Um, look, it's pretty simple to say water flows downhill. It don't flow downhill in Louisiana all the time. We get a storm coming in in the Gulf, guess what, the Vermilion River is going north. And in other areas, it's doing that. So this flat topography has made it very difficult for us to understand the hydrology of the, the watershed. So we need some models that we can plug in certain things and make some certain predictive tools to help us in understanding the watershed. And that's what this is all about. Um, we have a steering committee of about 16 parishes. I represent the million parish. Uh, on this committee, and this committee, steering committee, overall steering committee, is broken down into three subgroups, uh, subcommittees. I, I'm a member of two of them. Um, I felt that the uh, floodplain management and the capital improvement were very important uh, subcommittees, that, and I'll go and look at the details about which each one does. And it was Donald Square's only governor. 
The governance in long term is basically saying, okay, are these geographic areas what it should be? Is region five what it should be? Should we be smaller or should we be larger? So they kind of take a look at that. They also take a look at uh, funding scenarios. What do we need to fund this, um, this watershed initiative on a continuing basis? This $1.2 million sounds like a lot, but we want to put it into projects and we want to put it into something sustainable that we can continue with. We may need some legislation to uh, for this governance creation, and that's what this subcommittee is all about. Um, basically just for um, projects. Uh, so projects are very important and I want to be on that committee. And the other one is the floodplain management. Uh, basically you want to take an inventory of everything that's out there and coordinate with everybody. Because you have police juries, you have grab drainage districts, you have everything that are out there operating their own structures in their own little small uh, entities. So what we want to do is expand and coordinate that with everybody. Naturally, we're not doing this by ourselves. We have plenty of help. Um, and we have an action plan kind of put together. So we'll put up here for um, and then basically what we're doing right now is a round one. We have that $100 million seed money from that $1.2 million that we're looking for projects. So we have a call out for projects right now. The best thing to do is go to the planofkdiana.org um, uh, website and it gives you all this information. We're looking for input from you individuals to give us projects that we may not be aware of. Uh, there's some good uh, flood risk presentations on this website. Also, there is a newsletter that you can sign up to get all the information, more that I'm giving you now on a monthly basis. It's a great website to be, a great informative website to be on. And there's gonna be a lot of things happening in the next few months. We have our, our meeting calendar, and I'm going, unfortunately, to all of these meetings. Uh, and fortunately, I am. Vermillion Parish is at the bottom of the bowl. Okay, guys? Every drop of rain that falls in Evangelion Parish is going to work its way down here. I want to make sure that Evangelion Parish keeps their rain. I don't want it. If it gets in Vermillion River, it's already too late. The tributaries have to hold their water before it gets to the river. If we just have the river function the way it's supposed to do, we can survive this and get by, but we all have to work together, and that's what the Louisiana Watershed Initiative is all about. Sorry, guys, there's a lot of material. I, I probably ran over a little bit. Any questions? I'll be glad to try and answer. Yeah. Maybe you could just make a statement about what's going to happen on the, the, the bypass in the future. That, that is a big particular project that we have with the hazard mitigation. The hazard mitigation, we got some funding of about $25 million uh, because we pooled our resources. And that was sort of the catalyst for the Watershed Initiative. Since we were working so good together as collectively as a parish, the governor came to one of our meetings and said, I need to do this statewide. So that's a little story behind that. Acadia Parish, I mean, for me, Acadia Planning Commission was the catalyst that started the Watershed Initiative. Um, that was one of the projects that was picked um, because the worst, the the flooding that came in 2016 basically almost shut down our two bridges. Uh, the bridge downtown was uh, had a lot of trash. They didn't want to lift it. They let all that trash go because they were afraid they couldn't see it back. And then the bypass was flooded up into the bridge. So this project here is going to lift that 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 road with the proper amount of drainage, there's enough hydrologic studies going on, so we're not gonna impact anybody by raising that road, so that the next flooding event, we can possibly raise the bridge in, in downtown by the church and leave the bypass open for, for, uh, for, 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 for traffic. And that's ongoing, that's approved for funding, and they're in, they're in the uh, engineering design. Yes? Uh, talking about specific projects, uh, sometimes raising the, uh, the road, everybody north of it, it acts like a dam. Look at uh, uh, an escape uh, between uh, Baton Rouge and, and uh, what happened to Livingston Parish because of, of high uh, 12 or what? Right. 
there. Right. It was actually backwater flooding coming from the Vermillion River and because the uh, blockage on the old bridge, that line of debris and everything that was just blocking that, that uh, water, and it was backing up the, the Vermillion, backing up the valve towards the valve and flooding those residents. So two things can be done. We're taking a look at and raising the bridge, doing some skirting, trying to prevent the debris from building up on there. And we're adding additional drainage on either side of that, widening uh, the, the coulee so that you do not, there's some studies that come in that do not block that and flood. Let me bring you to a point that it wasn't coming back because there wasn't that much opening for it to come back. There was rain coming down too there. And a lot of that area flooded north of that. Correct. And, and as I said, you're not going to mitigate the 30 inches of rain yeah, in 24 hours. But if I can get that water off in a quicker area and prevent water from coming in from the Vermillion uh, River all the way from Lafayette and North, the river itself would be lower and that, that way it, it, so it's, it's not just, you have to get out of thinking just Vermillion Parish because that river takes everything from St. Landry on mm -hmm. down, from Evangelion Parish on down. So we have to work from the top up all the way down. Maurice has to drain out of the That's right, and we're tr planning right now to do some some retention and detention ponds of substantial amount to keep that water out of the huge torture and all those areas, those, those uh, drainages that come into the Vermillion River. So there's a lot of things going on. You need to keep active and, and innovating and all that. Um, and a good way is that website. And by all means, uh, if you want me to come back and update you again uh, next year, I'd be glad to do that. Thank you.